Hi listeners, Jason here. We are excited to finally announce registrations for the biggest psych health and safety community event ever. The inaugural The Psych Health and Safety Conference will be held at the Sofitel Wentworth, Sydney, June 19 to 20, 2024, and offer concurrent virtual attendance. It'll feature live podcast recordings with OG researchers, including Christina Maslak and Michael Leiter of Burnout fame, Psych Health and Safety USA podcast host, I, David Daniels, Australian super experts, including the likes of David Burrows, a special 10-year anniversary integrated approaches to workplace mental health panel with authors Tony LaMontagna, Angela Martin and Kat Page, hand-picked case studies from organisations doing it well, and a very special interview with plaintiff Zaggy Kozarov by Catherine Donlop on that High Court case which we previously covered on the podcast. This event will sell out. Get in quick to secure tickets at early bird prices for the two-day conference, pre-conference masterclasses and the VIP dinner. The first 200 in-person registrations also get a copy of her latest book, The Burnout Challenge, signed by Christina Maslach herself. Find out more and register at www.psychhealthandsafetyconference.com. Now, on to this episode. At some point in most of our lives, we'll be faced with the need to provide care for others at the beginning, at the end, or because of some form of disability in their lives. This responsibility does not diminish when we assume our role in the workplace and can complicate our ability to fulfill our work-related responsibilities. We'll talk about the role of caregiving, some of the psychological and emotional challenges, and the connection to the workplace. Up next on this episode of the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. From Flourish DX, this is the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. As workplace mental health has become a global priority, there's a greater focus on addressing psychosocial hazards. Each episode, we look at psychological safety from an occupational health and safety perspective. Let's talk psych health and safety. Welcome to this week's Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. I'm your host, Dr. I. David Daniels, and I want to thank you for tuning in each week. We seek to increase awareness of the importance of psychological health and safety by learning from the lived experiences, research, and expertise of our guests and advocating strategies to reduce harm and minimize vulnerability to psychosocial hazards in the American workplace. A caregiver, sometimes called an informal caregiver, is an unpaid individual Uh, For example, a spouse, partner, family, member, friend, or neighbor involved in assisting others with activities of daily living and or medical tasks. Formal caregivers are paid caregivers or care providers providing care in one's home or at a care setting, a daycare, residential facility, long-term care facility. So approximately 43.5 million caregivers have provided unpaid care to an adult or a child in the last 12 months. About 34.2 million Americans have provided unpaid care to an adult age 50 or older in the last 12 months. The majority of caregivers, 82%, care for one other adult, while 15% care for two adults and 3% For three or more adults, approximately 39.8 million caregivers for adults age 18 or older uh, have those folks have a disability or an illness. And 15.7 million family caregivers care for someone who has Alzheimer's disease or other forms of dementia. So these data points suggest that many workplaces have people who have either informal or formal uh, caregiving roles. And often the employer may or may not know about it. They may not be aware of it. Maybe it's it's the coworkers who know, maybe supervisors know. But these roles as caregivers can have an impact on the workplace because as much as we say, separate home and work, it's impossible to do that in many of these cases. Uh, Work and life really become connected when these Uh, caregiving roles come up. So uh, my guest today is someone who has experience uh, in this caregiver uh, caregiver role. Uh, 
and, and has actually taken time now to share the experience of being a caregiver with others uh, through, uh, through, through a podcast of her own. And so we're going to get into some of those, uh, some of that conversation and other topics as they come up. And let's get started with uh, the introduction, the way I like to introduce folks, or actually an introduction of my guest by my guest with this question. So who is Janet Williams? Well, hello, David, and thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure. Well, who is Janet? First of all, I am a child of God. Okay. That's why I'm first. You know, I'm a wife, I'm a mother, grandmother, you know, sibling, that person that loves to help others and make sure that everyone gets the best out of their life. Anything that I can do that can help them do that, that's who I am. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, there, there's a lot more we're going to dig into, but one other question before we get into that. What does psychological health and safety mean to you? When you hear that, what, is, what, what do you think of? My mental and emotional well-being. You know, that's your mind. That's, that's what it means to me. Mm -hmm. and, and, and particularly, do you think there's, and I will we'll talk about this, uh, is that just at work? Is that at home? Or is that all the time? I mean, what's, All what the time. Thoughts? It's it's an ongoing 24-7 part of all of us. Sure. You know, it's it's how you um, you know, they always had to say in your mind is a terrible thing to waste, you know. You know, is it gonna be positive or is it gonna be negative? Regardless as to when things occur, you know, that may be tragedies, or when things occur that may be, you know, bring you joy. And so all in how are you going to respond? How are your emotions going to respond? You know, what are you going to do? All with the mind. Right, right, absolutely. So, so let's let's get to the uh, to the real topic of the conversation. So, what what are some of the circumstances that placed you in the role of a caregiver? Well, my mother, uh, she had dementia. And um, actually, she passed away last July, July 2022. So I'm the youngest of seven siblings. And uh, we had to decide, you know, what are we going to do? You know, we had her in a nursing home, but that didn't work out. You know, COVID came and we found out she had got COVID and the nursing home didn't tell us. So she went to the hospital. She stayed there for a bit. And then when she was coming out, we said, okay. We need to know where she's going. She's not going back to her nursing home. So she has to go to somebody's house. So my brother, um, who's in Fredericksburg, Virginia, we decided that she was going to stay there with him. And so what the, the role, the guy, the rules were supposed to be is, you know, since there are seven of us, you know, everybody takes their turn. You know, of course, my brother lived there every day. So he was kind of like a 24 seven individual, but I had another sister. Um, she basically lived with them as well. And so she kind of took on the 24 seven role and everybody else did like the weekends. So until we decided to get a caregiver or a care provider, have someone come in to actually take care of our mother, they were doing it on their own um, seven days a week, basically. So we got a provider, they came in, you know, we had to teach them what they needed to do and make sure it was the right person. So when my mom got Alzheimer's, we all chipped in. And because I'm the only one that lives, you know, away from them, they're up in the DMV area. I'm in Florida. So I had to decide what am I going to do? So I decided to go up every other month. I would stay a month or stay two months to help relieve them. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. That, that's, um, well, first of all, it is a, you know, as I mentioned in the statistics, it's uh, it's not necessarily a unique thing, but it's a unique thing when it happens to you. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't uh, I do. I share some similarities. I'm actually the eldest of seven. And uh, these are 
that's something that really, you know, has kind of inspired me by, you know, listening to listening to your podcast is how you're sharing stories that people sometimes they don't want to talk about, but we probably need to talk about it because it's going to happen to all of us. It's more than likely going to happen to most of us at some point. And I, I was listening to some uh, to this conversation uh, about caregiving that we, you know, people need care at the beginning of their lives, at the end of their lives, and depending on what happens at points in the middle. So we're, I mean, caring for children. You said your mom, you know, that that's that's a caregiving thing. And wouldn't it be nice if we got weekends off from that one sometimes? But <laughs> maybe not. I mean, you know, the, as, as as much as we may say sending them to the aunt or uncle's house, you don't you really aren't off. You're just not around them because if something happens, you still have to. Yeah, they're they're still going to call. So, um, what when when this when this was going on? Can you share a little bit about um, how the caregiving role and the caregiving responsibility? How did that how did that strike you emotionally? It was well. I want to consider myself to have a very strong mind, very strong minded. And um, I have a spiritual mind, which is very important as well. But I knew, you know, we knew over the years, my mom had uh, dementia for about 14 years. So we knew when it started, you know, she was forgetful. She was repeating things. (laughs) She almost burnt up the kitchen, you know, things, things of that nature. So we knew. Um, so it really didn't bother me too much. I think when it really started bothering me was when I would come up and see her and she would look one way, just fine, healthy, you know, healthy, walking around, you know, running her mouth, being smart as usual. And then when I leave and then come back and you can see a decline. So every time I left and came back, especially in the last three years, you could see a decline. And that started to weigh on me because I didn't want to miss anything. You know, I didn't, I wanted to be a part of everything that I could be a part of. You know, I wanted to be there when, you know, when she stopped walking because she got a blood clot. and. Um, she became bedridden and she never really got back up. But, you know, it's things that you want to be there for, no matter how um, you know, how bad they are or how good they are. I just didn't want to miss anything. And that's what I was kind of feeling at a point. You know, it's, it's not it was I didn't have any guilt. I didn't have any shame or, or any anything. It's just that I just didn't want to miss any part of her life that was left. So that weighed on me, but being grounded, you know, being grounded in my faith, being grounded in God that, you know, it, it helped bring me back to a stable place because I know, like you said before, you know, none of us are going to be here forever. So, so we know we're going to have to leave one way or another. And I was just thankful for the opportunity of being with her in her last time, in her last years, her last months, in her last day. So, um, so it, it, if you let it, if you let your emotions overtake you, it can really take you down a a spiral road. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'd, I'd imagine it was probably different for you than it would have been had you been there the entire time. Because when people are declining over a period of time, it's it's gradual, it's gradual, it's gradual. But you were able to see it, it was a dramatic difference because you're out of the situation and then back in and you can you can really think about, well, the last time I was here last month, you know, weeks ago, it was this and now it's that. And that's probably more, you know, probably a little bit more impactful to be quite honest. Yes, yeah. definitely yeah. so. Yeah. To see her go from, I don't know how much she weighed, let's just say 140 pounds to 60 pounds. Wow. wow. Really, really dramatic. Wow. Yes. 
Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, and again, you know, again, I, I do relate to, to the more of this as well, that the vast majority of my, matter of fact, all my family, except a couple of my sons are in the Pacific Northwest and I live in the Atlanta area. And so I, I get back, you know, a few times a year. I, I don't know if you do this with your family. I go like, well, when y'all gonna come visit me? Uh, because I, I, I tend to go back and visit a bit, but so there's the part that I'm not there all the time. But then on the other hand, when I do come and go away, emotionally, it may be even a bit tougher than being around all the time because you see those kind of dramatic shifts. And wow. Um, wow. That's, um, that's, a, that's a thing. Um, so how, how, how's work going while all this is going on? Work was going. So <laughs> I will say I am very thankful, you know, for the job that I do have because we have flexibility. And, you know, I work from home 100% anyway. I can work from anywhere. I can work from anywhere. And that was very, very beneficial uh, for me in this part of my life. Because I could just, you know, tell my boss, hey, I need to go up. I'm going up every other month. I'm still working. You know, no problem at all. I never had any issues with work. And when you work for a company or you have a team or a leader that is really a people person. And when I say a people person, an individual that truly cares, an individual that knows that life happens, you know, an individual that trusts you to know that you're going to get your job done regardless as to what's going on. So, um, so work was fine. You know, it was difficult at times to work and, you know, take care of her at the same time. But like I said, we did have a caregiver that came in, but you're still not 100% working because you just want to make sure that everything is going right in the other room. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, you know, interestingly, uh, the <laughs> I'd say the vast majority of the conversations I have on this podcasts tend to focus on the systems that don't work, to be quite honest. Because again, we don't have laws in the United States that make people do that type of stuff. So you end up with the companies and the organizations who see it's the right thing to do and see, look, we have good people that I want to retain that good person. You know, I want to keep them working with me. So it is worth it. I mean, I think, I just think there's a benefit of, you know, a company doing exactly what your company did, which is you know, people have things that come up in their lives, things uh, that, that happen that they, you know, have no control over and they can still produce, you know, that people can still produce, they can still produce this. Uh, yeah, this this mindset that I've got to get everybody back in the office for for what? I mean, seriously, for, for, yeah, for, really. yeah, 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 I, I, now I getting people back. Uh, you know, again, I was in the fire rescue service. You had to have human beings on the fire truck. I, okay, I get that. I, I, there are some things to build roads and bridges until we get, you know, machines to do it. Uh, I can see there are some situations, but but because we're in a knowledge economy now, <laughs> uh, you're, as long as your mind continues to function and you don't aren't impacted by dementia or Alzheimer's or something like that, it goes wherever you go. And exactly. it just makes sense. Mm -hmm. It just makes sense. Yeah. It does. And I think, you know, it it could be like a little generational as well, I found. Um, I found that, you know, the, the baby boomers around that age and older, they want to be back in the office. Because, you know, that's that's what we used to, <laughs> you know, going to the office. It's, it's comforting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, and then, you know, a lot, I'm not saying all, but a lot of the younger, the millennial, millennials, and why do I got to go in the office? You know, I can do this, I can get this done, I can get this done and get my job done at the same time. So, and, but organizations are trying to put a balance there, I guess, they're trying to build a balance, but I don't think there's a balance. I mean, if people want to go in the office, let them go in the office. If they have the office space, of course, if they want to stay home, let them stay home. As long as they're doing their job, you know, whenever you need to reach out to them, they're available. You know, they're disciplined. 
Let them work from home. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I, and this is a this is a a little bit of you know one of those scenic byways. But I, I know you're 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 involved in uh, in risk and compliance and those kinds of issues. Do you think that lack of attention to this issue uh, of you know the responsibilities of caregiving and things that going outside the office? Do you think that it could be a risk to a business by not paying attention to that? Yeah, it could. And I'm going to say that, but it's going to depend on the person, I think, that's the caregiver, you know. And I'm and I'm going to say it because it, it still depends on that individual's mindset, okay? Am I going to be able to continue to work and give my loved one the attention that they need, Right. Am I going to be making mistakes at work? You know, am I going to be sending files that I shouldn't send to the wrong people? You know, how much attention to detail is taking care of my loved one going to cause for my job? So there are a lot of, I think there's a lot of answers to that question, but it's going to depend on that individual as to how meticulous and if they are an individual caregiver where they don't have anyone supporting them or assisting them. I think that could really be a risk because it's a, the weight that that person is carrying and then the weight of the job, which is probably going to be demanding, you know, mistakes are going to happen, which could potentially cause that person to lose their job. Instead of taking, you know, what is it, FMLA or taking time off and stuff like that. So it depends on the person. But yes, it could be a risk. Yeah. So so, so let's let's dig into that for just another second here. Um, if you so let's say you have the magic wand, you now have the benefit of your experience, um, and your experience sounds like it went, you know, fairly positively, if not all positive, you know, in terms of how your employer treated you, what advice would you give to organizations and companies that, look, I, we want to do this, but we have absolutely no idea how to do it. I mean, we, 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 you know, we're, we're kind of afraid because we've traditionally had everybody in the office and we've just not done that yet, but we want to. So, Ms. Janet, how, how, if you were giving advice to organizations, how should they be thinking about this? They should, <laughs> there are a lot of pieces for them. And most of the time, the business is going to be thinking about it from the money perspective. That That's that's number one, money perspective. You know, are my people going to be productive in the office or are they going to be productive out of the office? So it's all about the money. But you got to look at your people. You got to look at the people that you have working for you. You hope that you've hired professionals and adults which of course we know sometimes there are some stragglers in there, but keep your people happy. If you have people that are producing the work that you need them to produce and they need to be home to take care of their loved one and they have the capacity and the support from others, let them work from home. It's, what is it going to hurt? It's not going to hurt anything. You know, if you need to, if you need to do a trial, you know, do a trial run, you know, have a couple people work from home. See how it goes. You know, do a test. You know, you always test and, and all that stuff. Do a test and see how it works. You find people are more happy, they're more productive. As a matter of fact, I believe people are too productive at home because you don't get up from your seat. Right. You know? <laughs> right. you know? You're all you're just there working. So, Do you need more psych health and safety in your life? Then head over to the Flourish GX Academy for several free on-demand e-learning courses. If you're an internal professional, follow Flourish GX on Eventbrite to register for any of our free fortnightly interactive webinars. Our flagship professional practice program is also exclusively available for internal professionals. 
the 12-week course blends theory, applied practice, and interaction with other professionals through live lectures and a monthly community of practice session. Find out more about all these learning opportunities or inquire about a bespoke in-house training at the Flourish DX Academy, www.45003.com. Now, back to this episode. Right, right, right. Yeah, I, I think it's a, you know, I, I, I think we are at a period of transition. I, I, I really do. And part of me wants to believe that, whether it's true or not. Uh, and and. I think it was accelerated by the pandemic, but I think it was going to happen anyway. That there are, and I, you know, I, I'll give a lot of credit to younger millennials and Gen Zers who have looked at baby boomers and you know uh, Gen Xers and said, "Look, why, why do I want to do that thing that you did? You know, that pension you were told that you're going to get that you're not going to get anymore because the company went bankrupt. That, you know." that healthy environment that you said you were going to be in, but now you have bad knees and a bad back. And, and, and I, I, I keep saying that these kids, and they, they are, are certainly my kids and my grandkids' age, they're a little smarter to go like, you know, I'm not sure if I want to do that, if I want to give all of this and then not be available for the people that I love because you want me to do X. And I, and I think those are all considerations that organizations should be having. Again, we unless you're going to automate everything, that's an option. But if you're going to use human beings, those human beings have other lives outside of being in the office or being online with you. They just do. And, and, to, and to your point, how is it that we can create an environment where they are as happy as possible? Again, we can't, you can't do everything. You can't make everything perfect. But uh, wow. Wow. So uh, some at, at some point in this process, you know, the I, I, I think you shared a little bit of this on, uh, on on the podcast. So talk a little bit about where the Dementia Diaries podcast idea even comes from. Well, it came from my mom, of course. Um, it was interesting because I had, even before she passed away, I had thought about having a podcast, uh, being more like a TED talk or something of that nature. And I just kept putting it off, putting it off. And... When my mom passed, um, I said, well, let me talk about dementia because a lot of people don't talk about it. I don't know. And really, it's a lot of black people that don't talk about it. It's, it's almost like it's an unspoken disease or, or something. So I said, well, let me share the information that uh, myself and my family went through and let me get some other guests to come on and share their experiences to help others that are going through the same thing. Cause I look at on Facebook and other arenas and people are just typing out their frustration and I don't know what to do. I can't do this. It's too much, you know, and being a person that has gone through that. Yes, you can do it. You can do it. And this is what I did to make it through, just like this other person. This is what they did to make it through. So you're constantly learning from someone else, taking pieces of their experiences and using them as yours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I the, the thing I found really almost as powerful as the idea itself was how you've involved your family, particularly early on. Uh, and now I, I got the sense that not all of your family was were as into it as you were, but they they seemed like they kind of you know well you know baby sis says she wants to do this we're going to support her. So ch chat a little bit about what that was like getting your family literally involved in the discussion. Well, you know they all supported me, but they told me I had um, two that told me that they weren't ready to be a part of it, and and I respected that because it was fresh. It was fresh. Um, she passed in July. We started a podcast in February. And see, we all have our own way of grieving. And for me, like I said, I was there with her when she took her last breath. You know, so it was myself, uh, two of my sisters, and one of my brothers and my sister-in-law. So we were there. And I mean, we were singing her own up to heaven. I mean, we were singing her songs. She was a singer. And we just sung all her songs until she took her last breath. And for me, I never cried. 
I never cried. So using the podcast is my way of grieving, my way of sharing, you know, so I asked my siblings and like I said, two of them weren't ready to do it, but the other ones were, you know, they were, they were excited. It was hard for a couple of them because again, it was still fresh, but they wanted to share the stories with others as well to see that you can get through it, you know, and, you know, having seven children we all have our own different mind and our own ways of thinking and our way is right and your way is wrong you know we we had some battles i mean we didn't have disagreements we had battles battles and um but it all worked together because we had to understand that we were all just trying to do the best for our mother right so when there was no you know maliciousness or anything involved. And once you take a step back and really realize that, it's like, okay, what what they want or what they don't want is really not hurting her. So what's the big deal? You know, so that's how you have to take it. Yeah. Yeah. I I I recently actually uh did a podcast episode and had my youngest sister my youngest son and my brother's youngest daughter and having a kind of a family conversation about psychological health and safety. And, and the, so the connection between the two is these are things that happen to real people that, that who, who finds out about what's going on at work? Family does. Who finds out about what's going on at home? Work does. Because those are the, generally for, for most people who are, you know, in the workforce, certainly for 150 or 60 million people, that you go to work, you talk a little bit about what's going on at home, you go to home, you talk a little bit about what's going to work. So that whole, again, workplace, you know, work-life balance thing, uh, matter of fact, I had a recent guest talked about the fact that it's really looking for work-life harmony more so than balance. Because it's difficult to, at sometimes it is all one and very little of the other. And sometimes it's, so it's really it sounds cute. Oh, let's add the work life. Really, can we get harmony? There are times when it really, you really need to give more to work for this period of few weeks or whatever it is. It's like professional sports athletes. I mean, they got to go play the game. So they can't. But on the other hand, there are also times, and again, this is a an example where you really had to give a lot to home. And the, the employer was wise enough, I want to say in this case, smart enough, have enough systems in place to be able to do that and not get all weird about it. Be because if they make it difficult, then it makes it more difficult for you. Exactly. And just think about, you know, years ago, you know, you would be so concerned, oh, I'm going to be late. What's going to happen? You know, you have it. Oh, I'm going to be late. Or I'm sick. I'm sick and I can't make it to work. Oh, am I going to get fired? Am I going to, you know, what's going to happen? You know, all those different things. And that takes a toll on you as well. But when you're in this type of environment, I really, the environment that I'm working in today, I don't have to worry about that. It is just so, it is just so stress free from that perspective. Work is stressful, yes. But for the emotional, you know, worrying about, Oh, if I do this, what's going to happen? If I do that, this is going to happen. I don't have any of that at all. Wow. Any of that at all. Mm -mm. Wow. Yeah, I, I, that is just so, really so wonderful to hear. And and frankly, I, I think you find out what your organization is really about when you do have situations like this. Because if everything is kind of clipping along and, you know, the company's making money and there's no conflict at home, everything's good, it seems fine. But what happens when you get thrown a curveball like this? What, what, what happens when you really need to do something that is, you know, that is very, very different? And again, what happens when your attention gets drawn into somebody? I'm going to make a wild guess. Uh, that's way more important than the folks at work. Love them. I mean, they're great people. But mom's more important than the folks at work. Exactly. I'm just saying. But, but, you know, that's the case for other people as well. I mean, but you know what? David, we, we often say it's the organization or the company. It's, it, I don't really think it's the organization or the company. I think it's the supervisor, the manager, 
the person that you are supporting, that you're working with, the leader of that team, you know, because if they know and if they have the perspective of knowing who they, their people are, how dependable they are, you know, being a part of their lives, you know, you don't have to tell your boss everything, but enough to know that you have a life outside and they are supporting you, that makes the difference. But if you have the, the company can put all the rules and, you know, regulations in place that they want to. But if that leader of your particular unit team or whatever does not have that people heart or caring heart, empathetic heart, it makes no difference in the world. Right, right, right. How, how, how would you say this experience has changed how you view others you work with? It, or if it has. It's... um. It makes me more empathetic. I'm going to say more empathetic. Um, I thought I was always this person that, you know, that was fair and clear. But, you know, of course, when something happens to you that affects you, you know, you kind of have this, this, this change, you know, and you just want the best for everyone. You know, if, if you need to... <laughs> Got some people they need to go take their cats to the to the doctor. Right, right, right. You know, I had a hard time with a person taking a cat to the doctor and missing work. You know, but after all of this hap this happened, you know, where is your heart? You know, you love a person, you love a pet, you love whatever it is. Yes, you go take care of it. Go take care of whatever it is you need to take care of because I know you're going to be taking care of work as well. Yes. Yeah. And, and and again, for some people, particularly those who, you know, aren't blessed with large families, their cat, their gerbil, their dog, they are family to them. They really, they really are. I mean, there's, there's been some recent, I know you live in, in Florida, but no, there's been some recent, matter of fact, it's been over the last uh, probably decade plus, certainly since Katrina, that the federal government has said, look, if you're going to open up a shelter, you can't tell people not to bring their pets. So if you can't take their pets, don't open up a shelter then, because those pets are just like family for people. And particularly as folks, you know, sometimes they start to age. They're, you know, they, their only companion is that pet, you know. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, it is interesting how, you know, a lot of times we think we are, you know, one person. We think we're really compassionate until we really get hit. And then we find that we can be even more compassionate than we were. Yeah, there's 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 more there. So so the um, are any any stories from the podcast here recently that have really they they've been yeah really impactful. So, there's so many um, stories, but I think the most over overlying theme is support. You've got to have support. And I'm not talking about, I mean, even if you're doing it alone, taking care of your loved one alone, you have to find an out. And what I mean by that is if you have to call a support group, call a support group. If you have to listen to a podcast, call a podcast. I mean, you know, listen to a podcast. There are ways that you can relieve your stress, relieve your mind without being with other people if you're in that situation. You know, like I said, I'm blessed. I was blessed to have my seven siblings, although the drama was there, but I had my seven siblings. It wasn't me alone. I remember one day, um, this was the very first time I was left alone with my mother. And um, I don't know where, where everyone went. I don't recall, but something happened. And I had a complete meltdown because I did not know what to do. I, I said, I don't know how to give her her medicine. I don't know how to turn her over. I don't know how to change her. I don't know how to do any of those things. And I mean, I literally had about a 10, 15 minute breakdown. But then I immediately said, okay, it's done. I'm here. I'm going to have to do this. So I figured it out. And from that day forward, I didn't have any issues 
because I figured it out. And I, I figured it out because I always would tell my siblings and everybody else, this is my mother. She brought me into this world. When I was little, she took care of me. When I was sick, she took care of me. If I had a scrape, if somebody bothered me, she was always there. So now it's my turn. And I took that on with um, vigor. I mean, I didn't have any problems doing it at all. There was no, um, oh, I got to go do this. Or I need to do this. Or I'm tired. It, was, it wasn't any of that. It was just done out of pure love, uh, unconditional love, what, whatever you want to call it. It was just done. So um, that's a theme that I, I try to let everyone on the show know. And for those in return, they tell that theme as well, because there are times you're going to be by yourself. There are times you're going to be alone, don't have anyone to help you. And you're going to cry out. You don't know what to do, but you just, you take that 10, 15 minutes, but you got to let it go. You can't dwell in it. I think the whole thing is you can't dwell in it. I'm that one person that if something happens, I'm going to take 24 hours. 25th hour or 24 hours in one second is over. You got to move. You got to push forward. You got to push forward. So that's what we try to tell everybody on the show. You got to push forward. You can't just give up and stop. Right. Because it won't change anything. That's, there's that part. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as I, you know, I mentioned a, little, a, a, a bit in the opener that um, virtually all of us are going to end up as a caregiver of some type at some point in our life. Virt I mean, it's it's the nature of humanity. Uh, it, it just, you know, again, I won't say 100 percent, but virtually everyone at some point is, is going to end up giving care to someone else. And, you know, to connect this again back to the Again, sometimes employers or workplaces don't think about it in this way, but the way the the kind of environment you create for the people that are in your employee, that work with you, that are in your organization, that is not just uh, helping them. That's actually helping them help other people. It, it it really is. It's it's kind of passing it on. It also can be just averse. It can make a really bad situation even worse. Because you're not supportive, because you're not thinking about that, because you got all these, you know, kind of ridiculous deadlines. It would probably be ridiculous whether or not the person was giving care or not. But it's really important. I really like what you said, too, about how important that first line leader is to be able to know and have developed a relationship with the people that they're with. You know, to be able to, to have some sense, even if I don't know the details, I know something's going on. This person needs some time. You know, and, and why not? Why, why, why not? Why not give them that time? Yeah. Because, you know, if you think about it, too, like you said, it could be a good thing. It could be a good thing for the company or it could be a bad thing for the company. You know, if, if I did not have the support that I had from my company, I would have had to quit. Because that's my mother. Right. That right. is my mother. I can get another job. Right. That is my mother. That right. and that is first and foremost. Don't make me choose because it won't Don't be you. It won't be y'all. It won't be y'all. <laughs> right. You know, and it just and it wasn't even necessary. Sometimes things were not even necessary to go awry when only thing you gotta do is just let people just live. You know, it is, you know, I agree, there is no work life balance. There's no such thing. They use it, but I say, no, there's never been a such thing. Because there are times when you're going to have to work more, be home less. Be home, but you still got to work a little bit. So mm -hmm. it's no balance. Right. It's harmony. Right, right. That's it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So so um, if, if there are folks out there who want to, you know, they want to follow along the you know, with the with the podcast, uh, give give us a little commercial about Dementia Diaries, and t tell us a little bit more about you know how to follow along and where to catch you and that type of thing. The podcast is actually called Dementia Diaries: A Caregiver's Journey. Um, I am on Facebook, I am on YouTube, and I'm also on LinkedIn. 
Our shows uh, premiere every second and fourth Thursday of the month. It's open to anyone that is a caregiver that's, you know, caring for someone that has dementia, any type of dementia. So if you want to reach us, you can call reach us at Dementia Diaries podcast at gmail.com. Okay. All right. Yeah. that And uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that there's some folks out there who uh, might want to do that because you're really you're just doing a service. Like I said, I, I, I've never heard anybody have a podcast about that. Now, there's things out there's a podcast about everything these days. Thank God <laughs> gives us some of some opportunities. But this is just a topic that is it's so relevant to everybody at some point. It, it, it's caregiving is going to and, and it's I think it's that that second part, the caregiver's journey. That's really the important part about it, because it's going to happen to us. I guess I should say, if we're fortunate, it's going to happen to us at some point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If it doesn't, it probably means you're not around, with it, which is a whole other conversation for another Appreciate day. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, uh, Janet, thanks, thanks so much for you know for sharing uh, a bit of your story uh, and continuing to help you know folks. It, it, those those are those are tough times. Those are tough times. I I'm fortunate to have. Uh, my mom was a teenager and I was born and uh, we're actually pretty close in age. As a matter of fact, me and my youngest sister are further apart in age than me and my mom are. So she almost seems like an older sister, but, 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 but the reality is she's having more birthdays and so am I. And, you know, it, it's, you know, just, just kind of watching at a distance, what you've been doing has caused me to think about, hmm, so what are we going to do about this? What are we going to do about that? And there's some conversations that we're having in our family that uh, we may have had, but we may not have had, had it not been for Dementia Diaries. So thank, thank, you, very, thank you very much for that. Thanks so much. And um, if you're watching this episode on the Flourish DX YouTube page, please do like, subscribe, share with your friends. If you're watching or listening to the podcast for the first time, welcome. I hope that something that you've heard will bring you back to a future episode. Previous episodes of this podcast can be found at psychhealthandsafetyusa.com. And please do become a part of the Psych Health and Safety USA movement by connecting to us on LinkedIn. Until our next episode, thanks very much for listening. And uh, we'll look to bring you another episode soon of the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. Thanks very much. Tune in each Friday for new episodes of the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. If you have a story or know of one that needs to be told, reach out to us on LinkedIn or send an email to david at id2-solutions.com or go to the Flourish DX website at flourishdx.com. We'll see you next time.